Joining us now in the Hyundai Texans radio studio, it's head coach Lovey Smith. Coach, great to see you. And let's talk about the game against the Cowboys. A lot of guys stepped up. You had a lot of guys out. You had Chris Moore step up. You had Tremont Smith step up, among others. What do you think of that, the ability of the players to rise to the occasion in a big-time environment? Well, what I thought, Mark, is that, that you know, that's what we're about. And I, I think most teams are. I mean, you have guys that you assume will be starting, playing the majority of the time, but you always have guys that are in that next role, you know, back up, ready to go, and looking for an opportunity. And that's what happened yesterday. You know, Steve Nelson went down. Traymond Smith has done a lot of good things for us around here. But Traymond just stepped into that role and played the really game of a lifetime for him. He's never had two picks in one game. Mm -hmm. So it's good to see players get an opportunity that deserve to do well and actually do well. Coach, wide receivers can be, um, what's the word, divas at times. Not all you time. said that. You said that I said idea. that. They can be that way. Yesterday, Chris Moore, your number one receiver, yeah. caught 10 passes. Yeah. He had 124 yards. He made key catches. He then on special teams downs a ball, downs a punt at the one, and he also had a form tackle that was as good a tackle maybe as anybody made all day. Here's a guy that just plays ball and just loves his opportunity and does the most of his opportunity. What does a guy like Chris Moore mean to you and the organization, what he's been able to do? Because I would imagine if somebody, if a receiver, and this is why I mentioned the Diva thing, hey, he's going to be the number one wide receiver this week. Oh, I'm not going to play in special teams. And yet there he is on all the special teams that he's always been on and really thriving for the team. So what does he mean to this organization? What does he mean to you as a coaching staff? Well, he means quite a bit. You know where we are right now. We know that we're not going to the playoffs. So guys are playing on pride as much as anything. And a player like Chris Moore, you're right, when you're a wide receiver and you love playing on special teams and you're one of the toughest positions in football is being a gunner on yeah. special teams. You can get a double team and all those different things. But Chris just answered the bell. Yes, he knew he was going to have a big role, main role, catching the football in his offensive wide receiver position, and he did that well. But those special plays that you mentioned, down in the ball on the one-yard line, and to just be able to – be as good a, a good enough athlete to be able to make those open field tackles. Uh, that's what we're about. We have some players that really just, uh, you know, if you're drawing up exactly and you're describing exactly what we want in our football players, you, you, you would be talking a lot about what uh, who Chris Moore is. Yep. Coach Jeff Driscoll, we were kind of joking on the air on a show, not during the broadcast, that when he rolled to the right and he throws that ball, sometimes those kinds of passes are no, 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 yes. <laughs> so what was that to you as the ball is in the air and he makes that throw sort of across his body, almost going out of bounds? Well, you know, quarterbacks and receivers spend a lot of time together. They have chemistry. You know, I, I it maybe it crossed my mind a little bit <laughs> when he was roll, rolling to that side, but – uh, got a lot of faith in Jeff mm -hmm. and getting a lot of faith, of course, in Amari. And that was, uh, you know, big play. And Jeff did, Jeff did that throughout. You know, he's a threat. And it's one thing, yes, he's an athletic quarterback, four or five quarterback that's as fast as most guys on the field. But he can pass the ball also, and that uh, gives us options when he's out there. Coach, talk about Amari. He has that touchdown catch. He also has two other catches that were pretty important. Second and six, picked up seven for first down. Yeah. Third and six, picked up a third down. And we talked about that, some players that have left here, and you've talked about, hey, maybe divorce is good. That happened with the Green Bay Packers for him because you're seeing a guy getting a second chance, and he seems to be making the most of it. How has he really flourished to be able to get on the field and get his opportunities like he did yesterday? Just that he's blending in well uh, with his new teammates. Um bright, smart player that's picked things up so quickly. And he has a track record. I mean, he's been a good football player from high school, college. Yep. And then sometimes you do need a different air coat. And um, we just love what he, what he was able to do, his first, uh, you know, first extensive action yep. that he was able to get with our football team. And uh, just looking, just excited about what we'll be able to do with him going forward. He had to improvise in that touchdown reception as well, Coach. And what about that? Bump Phillips used to say two kinds of players you don't want, one that never does what he's told, one that only does what he's told. So there's something in the middle where sometimes you have to just take it upon yourself to make a play. What about that part of things? Well, that, that is definitely the case. I, I do like those guys that do it, do exactly what they're supposed to do the majority <laughs> yeah. of the time than that other option. 
But uh, in football, plays do break down. And uh, there are some common sense, make a play, uh, situations that pop up. And a lot of that is on the, on the receiver in the, in the receiving game. A lot of it's kind of based on, you know, you think you're going to get this coverage. The guy's playing a certain way. You have to be able to adjust like everything else. They, he and Jeff made a great adjustment on that play. For a guy that has a defensive heart, takeaways are probably all at the top. Where does a goal line stand sit? And how when fourth and one and Dez and J.O. and Harris and everybody holds up and you make that stop – as a defensive guy, how does that feel? Where does that kind of rank in the Panther? All the things that you can do defensively, where's a goal line stand rank? Well, it ranks up there. You know, we have my wife, Mary Ann, and I have a, a lot of uh, grandchildren, and we kind of love them both. We have one here. We <laughs> yeah. love them both. I don't know if we love one more than the other, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm going to say that a goal line stand is, is hard to do first off. Yeah. Taking the ball away is hard to yep. do. But a goal line stand like that, it was just pretty exciting, you know, for the guys. It takes first discipline. Everybody has to be in their gap. Right. And somebody has to do something a little bit more probably against a great running back. So uh, big plays. As I meant, we were, you know, talking earlier, um, you know, Trayvon to get his first interception of the year and then to get, a, get another against a great quarterback, you know, and Dak Prescott uh, says a lot. Coach, they ran for over 100, but it just didn't feel like that much throughout the course of the game. You were making some key stops on third down, getting the ball back. What about the run defense overall against the Cowboys? I thought for the most part we controlled the run. You know, I think they had a reverse, a two in there also that picked up some. Dak ran a few times with a scramble. But for the most part, I felt like we controlled the run. You know, maybe the last three weeks or so, we played the run better and better each week, and we had to. We knew that in between Pollard and, uh, and Elliott, you know, we were seeing two outstanding running backs, and it seemed like that's life in the NFL too, but we are playing the run better. Coach, offensive line, no sacks, one quarterback hit, and you were able to throw the ball. The ball was able to come out of Davis or Jeff's hands, depending on who was throwing the football. How do you think that group up front played? You know, Kenny had to come out for a little bit, obviously. Jimmy went in a little bit. But how do you think that group played overall, open holes in the run game and then protecting your quarterbacks? Well, John, exactly what you, the, the, the stats that you mentioned, you know, no sacks, uh, giving the quarterbacks time to throw it, you know, and then being able to run the ball fairly well, too. All those things start up front with the offensive line. We talked, you know, some of the, you know, the, the weeks about not playing our best ball up there, but I thought they showed up against an outstanding uh, front seven uh, that the Cowboys had. With Jeff, Coach, Early in the season, you used him in that, we call it the Driscoll cat formation, and he runs with the football and whatever. And yesterday, obviously, a whole lot more against the Dallas Cowboys. How, how has he soaked that up as a professional? Because he's a quarterback, but, hey, you got to run with the football uh, to be part of this thing because we need you for that. What does that say about him and the coaching aspect of it as well? Well, if you just look at what Jeff has done throughout, I mean, I, he was he was uh, active two games early in the year. Yeah. But during that time, though, he's moved into a different role, and all yeah. he's done is show up every day. What do, what I need? What's my role this week? Mm-hmm. Just being a team player throughout. So, I mean, that's what we've seen from him, and um, it's good to see him have some, some success. And it, as I, I mentioned in the press conference, it gives you so many options, and um, it, we understand that now. All right, they know that we could possibly go that route. I think both quarterbacks kind of split the reps evenly yesterday. And Davis is in there. We can do an awful lot uh, with the passing game. But, uh, and, of course, when, if, if Jeff is in there, if, Jeff, if Jeff, Jeff is active. I mean, there's a lot of ifs right yeah, now. And right. We kind of want it that way as we go into the week. We have a lot of different options. And most of our opponents – you know, have to practice for quite a few things. That has to give us an advantage. Has Tremont lobbied for playing time on offense because, you know, he can do <laughs> that funny, too. Funny you mention that. <laughs> uh, uh, he has because um, – and if you see him throw the ball, you can see why. Wow. Uh, has an excellent arm. 
Uh, but, you know, most of our guys... I hope the Chiefs are listening right now. <laughs> most of our guys can do a few things, and, mm-hmm. they, and they let you know that. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody thinks they can throw a football. And play and, basketball. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, no we doubt. know you can, Coach. We've seen it at, on the Pat McAfee show. <laughs> coach, you got the Chiefs coming up, but I want to ask you about a former Chief who is a current Texan and a guy who played for the first time this week, Taylor Stallworth. What did he do for your defense inside? I know he played probably, what, 17, 20 snaps, somewhere in that range, but... He was really active. He was around the football. I think I want to say he was on the goal line stand. I can't remember for sure. But what did Taylor Stallworth give you on the inside? I thought he came in and did what exactly what we need our nose guard to do. Most of the time our nose guard is going to be an A gap, going to get double team every play. And we need him to stay in his gap. You know, hat in the crack is what we say. And occasionally rest the quarterback. Made a couple plays. He did that. He was disciplined, you know, in some of the stunts and all the things we asked him to do. Just a good start for a guy that's been here less than a week uh, in Houston, and he'll only get better. Coachable, played hard, just loved everything the guy did. Coach, what can you tell the listeners about how an acquisition like that is made with you working with Nick and talking about what the needs are? And I know that Dwum Ford no longer a Texan now, but he's made some plays for you as well, so that's got to be a tough decision. What goes into that that you could share with us? Well, I mean, we're what I've said about personnel, we're constantly looking to upgrade our roster, always. Nick and I start early in the morning. Most people are yeah, you know, a, lot, <laughs> a of lot of people are sleeping. <laughs> we start talking about uh, personnel, what we're going to do going forward today, tomorrow, this week, all of that. We have a profile. We've been together now a little bit, so we know exactly what we're looking for. And uh, if there's someone that's available – that maybe has been released or for whatever reason, we analyze and see if it makes sense to our ball team. And this did. I mentioned I knew their defensive line coach, and we watched him on video. Jock Cesare got involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all liked him, thought that he, he could, you know, fill a role for us. Simple as that. We met him, loved him, and uh, thought that it was worth going on that second date, you can say. And, mm-hmm. uh, again, he stepped up and did some good things. Man, if he did that on the second date, I want to see third, fourth, and fifth dates yeah. at that point. I want to ask you about Oboe because he has two plays that were instrumental in that game, Coach. He beats that tackle with the inside move to cause the fumble. Second and ten, next play he gets Dak's arm. I mean, back-to-back plays, and that play turned into Traymond Smith's interception. He seemingly has been playing at a pretty high level from the Giants game. That Giants game is the one that kind of yes. stands out because he played really well against the run, but it feels like – I don't know if it's confidence or what it is, just more opportunity, but it feels like Oboe's taking his game to a different level. Do you see it that way, and what have you seen from him? I do. First off, you know, John, about opportunity. Uh, you're right around the, the Giants game. I don't think he started the game, but, but he really showed up. Yeah. You know, showed up and showed out. He did. You know, mm-hmm. and that which gave him an opportunity the next week to start. But he's been doing some good things throughout. He fits the profile. He's got speed. He plays hard. He's a legitimate outside pass rusher, and that's what he's doing. It seemed like he's making flash plays uh, each week. Yesterday, those two plays that you mentioned, but it's so much, so much more. Yeah. Uh, he has kind of you know, solidified himself a little bit in our rotation and, uh, again, making plays, and yesterday really came through. Coach, a lot of talk about the Chris Moore being down inside the one situation late in the game, and nobody got a really good look at it in our booth. It seems like, and maybe you don't want to talk about this right now, but it seems like we should always have cameras right down the goal line and quick replay so we can always tell these things because you were in a first and goal situation. But how difficult is that as a staff when you're not really getting the greatest look at it? And it looked like he was short, but you'd love to see more. Well, you'd always love to see more in slow motion sometimes, especially on the mm-hmm. road. You don't have an opportunity to see that. But we have uh, quite a few coaches upstairs. We get as many looks as we possibly can. We make a decision on whether we think he's down or not. We deem Chris being down. Uh, the officials felt pretty good about him being down, and we think his knee did touch before. So, I mean, that's what we go with. And it's like that for – we had another fourth down stop. We have eyes up up in the sky, then look, we make decisions based on what we think at the time. Both teams had goal line stands, and we were talking about that earlier. 
Uh, how hard is that to work on in practice, though, when you have to get that blocking right? You want to be able to execute next time that situation comes around. Earlier in the game, you had a situation where Pierce was able to get into the end zone. How hard is that to work on during the week in practice when you can't be that physical in practice this time of year, I would think? Yeah, but, uh, you know, Mark, most of the things I'm talking about is not about the physical part of it. You know, when I'm talking about a breakdown in execution, a lot of that is more mental. We okay. miss a block, block the wrong person, something like that. Um, this time of the year, no one is, you know, practices aren't exactly how they were in training camp. It's more fit up, walkthroughs, uh, recover, letting your body recover, which takes longer, more and more time now the further you get into the season. So, and that's, it was more that those issues more so than the physical part of not doing it in practice last week. Coach, I know you haven't gone fully into the Kansas City Chiefs, but they get on prime time enough that we're football fans. We probably have seen him a little bit. I think we do know the quarterback's name, Mahomes. Yeah. He's a Texan. Yeah, he's, so I know it he, tugs at your heartstrings. Even stream. East Texas, right? Yeah, 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 he's yeah. from East Texas. Exactly. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I know where White Patrick House, is Texas. from. Uh, your thoughts on facing the Chiefs on Sunday led by Patrick Mahomes? Uh, outstanding. We played an outstanding quarterback yesterday. Yep. Um, but, you know, maybe people would argue the fact that, you know, the best quarterback in football is Patrick Mahomes. Uh, he does an awful lot of good things. He's mobile in the pocket, and he's mobile to buy time to throw the ball, can make all the throws. He's legendary how, you know, his arm, you know, ba baseball background. Uh, Kelsey is best tight end in football. So we realize uh, who we're playing, uh, what they're committed to. They'll run the football, and they have excellent running backs. But, you know, it's what they're doing, you know, throwing the ball that really gets your attention. And you're right, we know these are names. You know the stars coming into town. Uh, so we're excited about that. We played another great team yesterday. I thought that ha we'll have a chance to win it all. Of course, the next one coming in here, I have a chance. I think we'll have a chance to win it all, too. And we're familiar with a couple of our players. How do you go about putting together the plays of the look team when you're playing the Chiefs? Because, hey, do Good that question. shot put pass where you're <laughs> – running away from things, and you throw with your left hand and whatever else he does, he does so many different things with the football. Well, a good, good question, Mark, and just preparing for an offense coming in, especially this late in the year. You know how much video, how many plays we have on yeah. possible things that they can do. What you have to do this time of year is just make sure you know what you're doing. Our offense, they can get a lot of different looks, but they got we got to make sure that we're just running our offense the right way. And defensively, we work on our rules that should cover any play uh, as much as anything. And we try to just guess on some of the things that we think they might do against a defense that's similar to ours. And mm -hmm. we'll normally have like a four or five game breakdown on a defense that's similar to ours and see how they attack them. Coach, it's homecoming this week, and one of the things that you did back at OTA's mini camp was you had the former Texans come out and speak to your team how cool is it the Texans are bringing these players back and they come back to celebrate? And how important is that for your guys to, to see them and what they've become after they finish their career here? I think just homecoming in general. You know, guys that have worn a uniform and kind of paved the way for the current group of players that we have right now to, uh, to honor them. And, and really for us, I mean, this is a special weekend now, but it's in, you know, they're welcome here. You know, when you're related right. to someone, you can come and visit at any time. Yeah. And that's how we see it. But I think there's added pressure a little bit, too, for our current group of players when you mm -hmm. have all of the older players coming yeah. back to play our best, to show them, you know, the best version of ourselves. We are getting better. I know what our record says. We're getting better. And, uh, you know, and the plan, of course, is to play the best game we played all year this weekend. Amagey Bank Ask Coach Question of the Week. Well, we did this with Thanksgiving foods, Coach, so let's do it with Christmas songs here. Holiday songs. Give me an MVP and put one on waivers. One that I don't want to hear that one anymore. I know it's all personal opinion, but do you have a couple for me? Yeah, Dunny Hathaway this Christmas. Okay. There's Ooh, one. Dunny and, Hathaway. Um, Merry Christmas, Baby by um, Otis Redding. Two of my all-time favorites. And right now... You know, after Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. then I started listening to Christmas carols mm -hmm. pretty much daily, some form. Uh, so those are two that's played in our household, been played in my household from 
from a youngster on, and of course, I'm keeping those traditions going. But I could, we could talk on uh, great Christmas songs for quite a period of time. All right. We'll talk about the ones on waivers later. Coach, thanks a lot. Good luck this week. Thank you.